All right, we're about to start a regular meeting, but I'm going to adjourn without uh, objection our shade session. We've given appropriate guidance to our council, so I'm going to adjourn the shade session. And we will start our uh, public forum in about two minutes. So if everyone could take their seats, that would be appreciated. All right, good morning. This is the Gary Sansing Public Forum, October 20th, 2022. It's 9.30 in the morning, straight up. Please turn yourself under the vibrate, silence, or offsetting. The Gary Sansing Public Forum is intended for matters not included on the agenda for the upcoming Board of County Commissioners meeting. Citizens wishing to address items on the agenda should sign up to speak to such an item at the regular Board of County Commissioners meeting. Speakers shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, uh, protests, or other behavior which interferes with the orderly conduct of the Gary Sansing Public Forum. Each speaker is limited to three minutes unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow sufficient time for all speakers. At the chairman's discretion, the Gary Sansing Public Forum may end five minutes prior to the scheduled start of the upcoming Board of County Commissioners meeting to allow the meeting to commence on time. This morning we have six speakers, so each speaker will get the full three minutes. And we will start this morning with Shirley Piritz, followed by Victoria Griffin. Victoria Griffin, you're on deck. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Shirley Piritz, and I live at 1385 Finley Drive. I am here to speak in opposition to the proposed Outpost Bayou rental complex. I would like to address separation of this development from Finley Drive. While buffer zones and fencing have been added to the sides of the development that abut single family residences, and we thank you, the portion of the development that abuts Finley Drive has neither a fence nor a buffer zone. We residents see multiple concerns with this situation. One issue is parking. Since we have previously brought to your attention the development will have at least 200 vehicles with no place to park, Finley Drive could be a parking magnet for these vehicles if there is no fence and buffer zones separating the development from Finley Drive. Students and other tenants will logically park on Finley since its proximity to the new development is much closer than the Walmart or Pen Air parking lots. Secondly, the amenity areas of the development are on the parcels abutting Finley Drive. This is where the pool will be located and where social gatherings will occur. Without a fence and a buffer zone to separate the development from Finley, we can expect party attendees to wander our streets as late as 2 a.m. for fun, theft, or mischief. Thirdly, without a fence and buffer zone, the children of our neighborhood will be tempted to wander over into the development's amenity area, causing safety concerns for parents. I am asking you commissioners to direct staff to require the development to have both a fence and a buffer zone between the development and Finley Drive. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Victoria Griffin, followed by Mary Lou Newton. Good morning. I want to point out something before I begin. This row of seats right here is about 15 feet long. The reason I'm pointing that out is that's the current buffer zone that they are proposing for the townhome uh, 
the outpost townhome bayous. That's not very much of trees or anything else. I just wanted to point that out because visually I want y'all to understand that. Um, I am opposed to the outpost bayou townhomes. The uh, September 2022 plat of 157 lots does not show vegetated wooded buffer zone and or an eight foot privacy fence that's behind my home. That is supposed to be happening, but we do, I still want 75 feet. I believe it's needed. I've talked to my insurance agent the other day. She said, yes, we need to have a buffer zone under trees to prevent the wind damage. Um, the, buff the buffer zones are about 15 feet, but it is approximately 100 feet of open space between my backyard and the outpost bayou units. This is where the wet holding pond would be expected. The plaque does not show it to be, you know, wooded. Um, the, um, the 15 feet, of course, is not large enough to protect my home from wind, sound, noise, or lights. These communities are well established, and any development that invades our area should fit into the neighborhood, not, dis not disrupt it. The east holding pond needs to be placed further away from my back fence, and more trees need to be left for the woods. The county needs to be using the most up-to-date information on the flooding and require such to be used on all current construction. I'm not against development. Only developments need to be good for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I move to the next speaker, which will be Mary Lou Newton, I want to take a moment to recognize an elected official uh, that I just noticed in our chambers this morning, uh, District 1 State Representative Michelle Salzman. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being uh, part of the panel on Tuesday. Next speaker, Mary Lou Newton, followed by Glenn Conrad. Good morning. My name is Mary Lou Newton. I'm from the Tangent Heights subdivision where we have been flooding for over six months now. And then the county wants to come back and say, oh, well, they didn't follow code. Well, we knew that six months ago, and now everybody on Hiawatha and Lockhart has damages. The one thing y'all can't fix, with Kevin Blanchard coming out and cleaning up the contractor's mess that started the damages, you cannot fix my emotional attachment to my horse. You guys don't understand this. The physical level in which I live my life, you guys have interrupted that. You have covered it over. You have allowed this drainage problem to go on to where myself and five neighbors have damages now. So as the county now, <clears throat> Mrs. Rogers, since they came out and cleaned up the contractor's mess. Ms. Ms. Newton, address your comments to the chair, please. Oh, Thank okay. You. Jeff, um, is the county going to come out and now that they've covered up and cleaned up the mess the contractor caused, which is part of the Map Banks, Jess Lulacos, Flynn built contractors, they're all in the same family. Flynn built contractors is who damaged us, flooded us out, and now the county wants to come back, clean up his mess, and say, hey, it's done. No, that's not it. There's damages that have been caused that now the county is coming out and covering up and cleaning up. They're still selling the houses that have flooded on Hiawatha, and two of them are for sale. Have they disclosed that in the contracts? How can they list certificate of occupancies for houses that have flooded before they've even sold and that are not even up to code? How can they put people in these houses? I don't get it. Nothing's being done. I'm wondering if you guys are sitting up there bench warming for the actual players to come in and do something. You grew up in San Diego. So did I. You know better. So do I. Water runs downhill. All of y'all. Water runs downhill. It's damaging our houses still to this day. And my horse is still hurt. My horse is still hurt. You cannot fix that. That's an emotional attachment on me. How many times I come down here and tell you this? My horse is more than any one of your houses or all of them put together, especially for the emotional level that I have with him. And you cannot fix that. So please come out and do something besides just trying to fix and cover up what's going on. Thank you. Next up, Glenn Conrad, followed by Gail Roten. Commissioners, good morning. Good morning. Glenn Conrad, 17 Northwest Gilliland Road in uh, District 2. Uh, 
Please consider this first an apology. I didn't speak at the, on this topic at the last commission meeting, uh, but consider it as an address, a redress for grievance. Uh, recently, District 2 duly elected a new uh, county commissioner who was up for the chairmanship role. Last time, this was denied to him and the citizens of District 2. So here today, and particularly, I would say that he was duly elected with a pretty good margin. Uh, yet, uh, this rotation change that was voted on last time uh, will mean that District 2 does not get the commissioner's chair role for quite some time, I think about 12 years in total, given the past and his, and his tenure. Um, so what I'm requesting today is that particularly the three Republican commissioners, since this was a Republican candidate that was elected, one of your peers, you know, Commissioner Bender, Barry, and Bergash, that one of you revisit, make a motion to revisit that action and in restore the normal rotation to the chairmanship role here. Commissioner May gets a pass on this since he's a Democrat. Thank you very much for being here. Maybe we need some more. Uh, uh, so, uh, okay, but uh, that's my request here today. I think that this, this action was a bit prejudicial to the citizens of District 2. Uh, we don't get in that role. Certainly it has some privileges and uh, there we go. So I challenge the three of you to make a motion to revisit that action and make a change and have the normal rotation restored. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, yeah. if I may? Yeah. Um, Glenn, I'll say is that, I mean, having served as a commanding officer in the Navy and also having served as the chairman of this board, um, I can say with certainty um, that the incoming commissioner uh, would have the skill sets necessary uh, to uh, do the job of chairman uh, on his first day. Um, it's, that really is a, is, it speaks to the quality of the staff um, that really does 99% of the work up here. We all know that. We, <laughs> I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Um, but certainly with the level of staff support um, that the next chairman will receive as the current chairman has and the past ones before that, um, you know, I, I'm firmly confident that uh, incoming uh, uh, Commissioner Kohler would absolutely be able to, uh, to fulfill those duties without any problem. But I have not heard anything from uh, Commissioner Let Kohler about what his uh, position is on that. So it'd be, I mean, it, it, that would be very interesting to know. Robert, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, we, we got a couple calls on this on, on how I could put a Democrat in the vote for a Democrat to become the chairman. Uh, Lumen, you're the next man up. I mean, it's the rotation. And, um, you know, and, and uh, Allison, I do believe you did reach out to. Uh, Commissioner-elect Kohler, and he, he did ask to defer. Is that correct? And he was also made aware that, that the topic was going to be discussed, and he had every opportunity to be here that night uh, to speak for himself if he wanted to be. The ask, and I have not spoken to him about this in the last couple of weeks, but his initial ask was to defer for one year and cycle in as the chairman his second year in office. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, again, I mean, it's... Um, that he's, he's welcome to come down and talk to us if, if he wants. Thank you, Robert. Robert, I'm glad you said that. I am the only Democrat, but if we do like other commissions uh, where you, you vote on the chairman every year, I bet you we may have a Democrat every year. So, you know, I mean, we've, not, we've done anything that's not consistent. So um, those are the options. Uh, it's rotational, you know, and I don't care how we do it. I mean, you know. I don't think that the chairman has any more power than anybody else on, on this on, on this board. But if we ever decide that we want to, you know, go to an election, I'll be happy to support that. All right, Gail Roten, followed by Jean Brown. Good morning, commissioners. Thank Good morning. you for having me. Um, my name is Gail Roten. I live at 1290 Finley Drive. I am here in opposition to the proposed outpost bio rental complex. I'm concerned with traffic. And I know that uh, Mr. Bender has been out and visited the neighborhood. And I would encourage all of you to come and visit the neighborhood because it's hard to explain that there is one way in and one way out. This is a lollipop circle and there's, there's, there's no in or out with that one, that one entrance. And that, that's just 
the, the, that's just the logistics of it. So I encourage you, like I said, you can ask Mr. Bender, he's been there. I encourage you guys to come out if you have time or just ride by, ride through the neighborhood. Um, again, I'm, I'm concerned with traffic. Um, thanks to the county staff who recognize that Finley Drive is not a road that should be accessed by the proposed development, either during construction or after it's completed. I'm here today to ask you commissioners to direct staff to remain firm, please remain firm in this requirement of the developer. If you allow the developer to use Finley for the construction entrance, it will be so easy for them to use a bait and switch trafficked, you know what I'm talking about, to either use a bait and switch traffic uh, tactic and either uh, fail to get a permit from the DEP to build a bridge to get access uh, from JoJo Drive or claim that the road uh, cost of such a bridge is prohibited. Um, this would result in the, develop, uh, the developer building a rental complex with no way in or out. And you know, that's what I was talking about. Uh, and, and then demand to use Finley Drive for access. And I'm telling you, you need to take a drive out there and see that that many vehicles, I'm, I'm, I think I'm understanding uh, two, 300 cars a day. Um, it's just not possible. So please, commissioners, direct staff to hold strong. Please hold strong in prohibiting the developer from using Finley Drive as a construction entrance. I mean, I'm just one voice standing up here. I'm just one person, one voice, but I've got a lot of people back there that's got the same con these exact concerns. I'm talking for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Gene Brown. I'm sorry. Yes, Gene Brown. Then George Levy, you're on deck. You could call me just plain Jean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Jean Brown of 1475 Finley Drive. I oppose outpost value rental townhomes. The August 25th, 2022 Access Management Review provides this comment to developer. Please review Design Standards Manual 2-1.2. Improvements to West Side Drive and JoJo Road will be required. Article 2, Transportation, Roadway Design. The portion of payment, pavement required to be installed at the developer's expense is set forth below as a condition of approval of new subdivisions on roadways which do not conform to county standards, the developer may be required to improve the portion of said road which adjoins or pro provides access to or is within the proposed subdivision. Improvements may include installation of turning lanes, improve, increased pavement widths, etc. On 2-1.1, minimum right-of-way widths of streets, the street type and the minimum right-of-way width. Arterials, 100 feet. Collectors, 80 feet. Local, 50 or 66 feet with swales. Alley, 20 to 30 feet. The existing streets which adjoin or provide access to the proposed subdivision outpost townhomes are um, Jojo Road, 18 feet pavement, 30 feet right-of-way, alley. Finley Drive, the circle, 18 feet pavement, 66 feet right-of-way, local street. Westside Drive, 24 feet pavement, 66 feet right of way, local. So Jojo Road and Finley Drive have pavement width of an alley. Finley adjoins, Jojo and Westside provide access. There are problems with widening Jojo. There are five Fox, Fo Fox Hollow homes that front Jojo the, on 30 foot right of way, 18 foot pavement, six foot shoulder on each side of the street. Five Fox Hollow homes are 37 feet from the street edge. If Jojo right of way is widened to 50 feet and the pavement is widened to 24 feet, which seems to be the standard uh, of road that is required for a development such as this, then their driveway will be 30 feet, uh, barely enough room to park his truck. Uh, their homes are, will be right on the street. 
the warranty deed from Bennett's to Seven Amigos, December the 2nd, 20, uh, 2004, has a restrictive clause saying, grantor shall not convey any additional right of way from lots five and six in block seven for the widening of Jojo Road or other roadway. Jojo is lined with large oak trees, possibly heritage, which would have to be removed. The sewer and water lines will run along each side of Jojo. Yes, improvements would be required. Remember Finley Jojo. Thank yes, ma'am. Thank you for being here. George Levy, you're recognized, followed by Larry Downs Jr. on deck. Hello, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, I have two copies of my presentation. Oh, okay. Um, we'll, uh, Sharon's going to grab that. I'm here for two different topics. Um, first one, I want to mention um, the concern with the violence. The, the topic has been with the county recently, gun violence. And I want to uh, enter. I want to mention the rest uh, of the commissioners, the comments I gave to Commissioner Burgage and Representative Saltzman in an email that I sent yesterday. Um, and I got that email, George. Thank you for sending it. Okay, but I want, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I could not attend the crime gun violence roundtable on October 18th, but want to land a comment for your consideration before jumping off the deep end and letting the gun grabbers run wild. I recommend taking a closer look at who are the people committing these crimes. How many are repeat offenders? Thanks. If they are repeat offenders, why are they let loose on the streets? Has there been a political push for the leniency that is allowing criminals out early and lesser charges. If you go to the, to the hot stove philosophy, if you touch a hot stove, you are going to get burnt. No, no matter how many times your mother and grandmother told you don't do it, if you do touch it, guess what's going to happen? I bet if the existing laws were, are enforced and a lot, le 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 lot less leniency for repeat offenders, it will send a strong message. If you do the crime, you are going to do the time. Without a doubt, many controlled types are going to push limiting the rights and privileges of law-abiding citizens. That needs to be challenged and not allowed. It needs to be on those who commit the crimes. And all the newbies who commit a crime for the first time under existing conditions and current message and mentality is no problem. No matter if you use a gun and kill someone, doesn't matter, they will only slap your wrist and let you go. This is the wrong message. Someone needs to send, take a closer look at the prisoner rights compared to the victim's rights and citizen's rights. Since then, since when are criminals in prison entitled to more, better treatment? Um, I am available anytime to clarify, I have a way to straighten out the parole, probation, and early release situation in real time, later, more later. Also, there was a mention about flooding and the flood areas. That's only half the answer. You have to have the, the, the rainfall too to give a total volume. Only having the proper area and not the total flood rainfall is not, is not gonna be conservative and you're gonna hit infrastructure failure. Thank you. Thank you, George. Final speaker, Chris, I don't have one for you. Uh, unless you've signed up. You did? No? Okay. Final speaker, Larry Downs Jr., recognized. Hello, Larry Hello. Downs Jr. All right. I'm going to pull out a few papers here, but before that, uh, I think we may have a uh, speaker that came up here about three or four before me. He said, uh, you know, three Republicans up here, or four, one Democrat. I think we may have three or four Democrats, or at least uh, leaning. Um, you know, definitely not a classical Republican if you just look at the voting, you just look at the voting record. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear and evident, and it's uh, documented. But anyways, back to this issue, uh, the recusal. You know how it's, uh, it's not good for the people y'all appoint 
to recuse themselves if they know somebody, if they do business with them, if they do business for them. But it seems to be just fine for y'all. And in that form that you fill out, it says for appointees also. It says that. It's amazing. And also, just so you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, walking out of the room when you don't want to vote on the tough items, you know, the hard things. That's what y'all said, you know, Larry, if you can't vote on the hard stuff, well, it seems to hear Commissioner May absent. Uh, Commissioner May absent. They're, they step out. Uh, Commissioner May absent. These, I mean, th there's so many of them. Uh, it, Bogosh carries, uh, carried uh, the motion three to zero with Commissioner May having left the meeting and Commissioner Robinson abstaining, filling out a form B. I mean, this is this ain't even all of them. Uh, Commissioner May having left the meeting and Commissioner Underhill abstaining. Uh, Commissioner May having left the meeting, Commissioner Robinson abstaining, filling out form. 8B, Memorandum of Voting Conflict. It just goes on and on. Uh, com uh, Commissioner May having left the meeting and Commissioner, I, I mean, you got to vote on the hard things. You just can't step out like I got to go to the bathroom every time uh, to keep from uh, making your, uh, your, your constituents uh, uh, mad. Uh, same thing here, Commissioner Robinson abstaining voting conflicts. Uh, Commissioner Bender abstaining, filing a Form B memorandum, voting conflicts. Here it is. It says elected officers, and then right below it, the same form, Section 12.3143. Uh, of course, you know we have two of those. Uh, although you may abstain from voting in the situations described above, you are not prohibited by the section from otherwise participating in these matters. However, you must disclose the nature of the conflict and make no attempt to influence the decision, whether orally or written, whether made by you or Thank you, Larry. a direction. We, your time is up. Thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. uh, his time is up. Yep. I mean, one thing I didn't walk out on when I voted for him to be off the board. Yeah, you didn't abstain from that one. Thank you. That concludes our public forum. We'll restart our regular meeting. We'll, we will convene our regular meeting in three minutes. We'll see you at the next public forum.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will start this meeting in one minute. Please take your seat. Thank you. Well, at least you just admitted he's a Democrat. That's good, <laughs> Representative. <laughs> Before the meeting's over, he may be an independent, though. Are you going to stay for this song? All right, good morning. This is the regular Board of County Commissioners meeting, October 20th, 2022. It's 10 o'clock straight up. Please turn your cell phone to the vibrate, silence, or offsetting. The Board of County Commissioners allows any person to speak regarding an item on the agenda. The speaker is limited to three minutes unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow sufficient time for all speakers. Speakers re must refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other behavior which interferes with the orderly conduct of the meeting. Upon completion of the public comment period, discussion is limited to board members and questions raised by the board. This morning, I will be bringing the invocation. I will ask you to please stand and join me, and then stay standing, and we will do the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me this morning. I'm going to ask for a moment of silence, and I'd like to dedicate this moment of silence to a community member we lost this week, a devastating loss to the community of Roger Scott Tennis. Um, uh, Terry Thrash passed away uh, unexpectedly from a massive uh, health condition. Um, and so his memory is burned in all the people who he've he has taught throughout the years. Uh, um, unfortunately, his uh, service will be this morning during our meeting, so I will uh, be unab unable to attend um, the memorial service. But let's, uh, let's do a, a moment of silence in memory of Terry Thrash. Thank you. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We're going to go right down the list because it's my understanding we've got one or more members that have a, a time conflict starting in, in about one hour. So we're going to move quickly. And as I always uh, am want to do, I want everyone to know who's watching and is here in attendance. We were, we've been provided these materials. We've each had one-on-one -on -one meetings with staff and we've done our independent research. Um, so it might look like we're moving quickly through the items on this agenda. However, each of us uh, has had the opportunity to be fu fully prepared uh, to make the votes that we're about to take. So with that, we'll go to item number four. Are there any items to be added to the agenda? Madam Attorney. No, sir. Commissioner Bender. No, sir. Commissioner Berry. No. Commissioner May. No, sir, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Underhill. None, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Okay, and none from me. Commissioner's Forum. Commissioner Bender, you're recognized. Do we Mr. need to adopt Chair the... Oh, I'm sorry, yes. I move, I move for the adoption of the agenda, Mr. Chairman. Okay, okay motion to second. You got that? Please vote. All right, the agenda is adopted unanimously. Now we will move to Commissioner's Forum. Commissioner Bender, you recognize. Thank you, sir. Um, our thoughts and prayers over the family of Officer Kevin Ray. Last Saturday night, Master Deputy Kevin Ray, 20 plus year deputy with the Scambia County Sheriff's Department and his daughter Lauren were returning home from a football game in Troy, Alabama when their vehicle was hit by a drunk driver. Uh, sadly, Deputy Ray died instantly and his daughter Lauren is in critical condition at Shands Hospital. Um, and I know a GoFundMe page has been established to help out with um, her medical expenses. Um, so it, it's, uh, in talking to some people, of, of course, it will take a, a miracle to, to pull her through this. Um, so our thoughts and prayers are with them and uh, mm -hmm. with the Sheriff's Department. Um, I, I did enjoy uh, being joined by, by my colleagues, Commissioner Mayor, Commissioner Pragosh, and Commissioner Let Kohler at the Sheriff's Roundtable on gun violence on Tuesday evening. Um, I think we've uh, at least have a, a, a direction to head in and, and some follow-up that, that we're working on. Um, and so I appreciate the community being involved in that and the, and the Sheriff organizing that um, and look forward to um, getting some work done over the next few weeks. Um, during the recent uh, 
District 4 neighborhood cleanups, 107 tons of debris was picked up, including 451 tires, 317 gallons of paint, 5,100 pounds of household hazardous waste, um, and, and it's something that uh, we set up in the last couple of years and um, clearly have, have heard from the residents that they enjoy this, so uh, we'll continue to, to do that. Um, I know some people on the beach uh, were inconvenienced yesterday. There was apparently a, a film crew um, that was doing some filming in the late afternoon. Um, my understanding is, uh, in talking to the Sheriff's Department, that that, that is over. Um, and so um, uh, once we, uh, we were aware of it, we did monitor the light to help alleviate any traffic as, as the cars that had been stopped came up to the light. Uh, and then finally, uh, I want to thank Skimby County Fire Rescue for inviting me to, to be part of their uh, arrogant steak cook-off team on, on Friday night. Uh, I think we cooked over 100 steaks in, in three hours, and um, it was a great event put on by Seville Rotary um, that funded a number of uh, nonprofits. Um, but uh, uh, even though someone in the front row didn't, didn't vote for us, um, uh, everyone else said that we had a really good steak. So, um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's where it matters. It doesn't really matter what the judges think, even if they're elected officials. So, um, sorry, Michelle was a judge in case anybody wants to know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that's okay. Well, it, the people appreciated what we put out. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Barry, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two things I'd like to, uh, uh like to mention. Uh, next Wednesday, there's going to be a, a cleanup in Farm Hill in the Farm Hill community. Uh, just a little bit west of Highway 29, a little north of Muskogee Road in Cantonment. So we're excited about doing that. There was a, uh, there was one about a month ago in the Cottage Hill community on the east side of 29 in that same uh, in that same vicinity, where there was a tremendous amount of uh, of garbage, debris, and, and uh, things collected. So excited about that. That's going to be next Wednesday, and then there are tickets uh, that are on sale right now at, through Pensacola Sports Association. But the, uh, the SEC Women's Soccer Tournament is going to begin next Sunday. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, the week from Sunday on the 30th at Ashton Brosenham. It's going to run for a week, uh, with the championship being on Sunday, November 7th. I'm sorry, November 6th. And uh, you know, I hope everybody would have an opportunity at some point in time, maybe during that week, to uh, to stop by and see uh, see the setup from the SEC. All the games will be uh, televised live on the SEC Network through the SEC. Um, through ESPN and the SEC partnership on the SEC network, uh, ESPN family of uh, uh, companies or channels. And that's an extremely exciting thing for our community. Uh, you know, I think it's something that, you know, a few years ago, no one in, uh, on our board or in our community could have anticipated the opportunity to actually host an SEC uh, championship here. It's, it's unprecedented and it's very exciting and it's hopefully something that we are able to uh, keep in place um, I know there were some media days earlier this week with the Sunbelt basketball tournament where, uh, you know, it sounds like those, those conversations are going very well and, you know, we've got a great partner there and they seem very happy and I know we're happy to have them. Um, um, and lastly, Mr. Chairman, it's not anything that's going to take board action, but uh, when we get to the end of the meeting after the discussion items, I'll take five minutes and update the board on uh, some of the conversations had related to the broadband. But, Fantastic. Yep. Looking forward to that. Commissioner May, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And certainly want to um, thank uh, Commissioner Bender and uh, actually Representative uh, Salzman and I see Representative Andrade staff here uh, for being a part of the Soul Bowl. We had up to 6,000 people uh, from the inner city to urban core at Blue Wahoos. Uh, certainly want to thank Mayor Robinson and Mayor Leck Reeves uh, and Chief Randall. Uh, it went off without any any problems, without any scuffles, and uh, it was a, a great place and a great day uh, with all of our partners. Uh, FPL was a great partner, and obviously Troy Rafferty and Quinn and Rishi Studer uh, for just being uh, great supporters, and Sheriff Simmons and uh, his team was there. I certainly want to give my condolences and prayers on Tuesday. I was at a funeral. Uh, many of you um, know Perdido, but most don't know Wingate Beach. Uh, it was one of the first African-American beaches uh, with Johnson Beach and Rosie Reynolds, who's a sister of, of John and Alvin Wingate, uh, was laid to rest uh, this Tuesday at the Mount Olive Baptist Church and what a legacy family and to her sister, Linda Green. Uh, she continues to be in our prayer and um, to Officer Ray, uh, his beautiful wife, Rhonda Ray, uh, who also works at the Sheriff's Department. Our prayers are, are with Rhonda, uh, as my colleagues have said. Um, certainly want to thank uh, our CRA and Claire Long and her, her crew, uh, understanding the importance of neighborhood cleanups. Uh, 
Uh, and as, as you alluded to, Robert, it's very important to uh, keep our neighborhoods clean. So we certainly want to thank Claire and her staff for organizing uh, those neighborhood cleanups and, and doing ride-alongs uh, with my office. Um, we don't get an opportunity to talk, Robert. We were a part of the round table of gun solutions. And, you know, sometimes I, I hate round tables because you just go round and round and round and uh, there's nowhere at the end. But I thought that it was a very beneficial meeting. And uh, I like that the sheriff called for uh, action plans and uh, the mayor can speak for himself and sometimes state reps can speak for themselves. But we have to speak as a body. So at some point, uh, my position uh, is poverty and jobs, and uh, I would love, at Mr. Chairman, I don't know if we'll make it before you, Chairman, or when I'm on Chairman, uh, but you know there has to be a real conversation about who are we doing job creation for, and how are we working with our partners at the Minority Chamber, and how are we working with Florida West to create job creation for those who are disfranchised, and so uh, certainly want to put that on, and you know I know that he's called for in two months to come back with an action plan, and my action plan is to go back and how are we creating jobs uh, for those kids in the urban core and to have that conversation yes. uh, so it won't be round and round so we'll speak with one united voice and that's the reason i bring it up now jeff i mean we all have our individual uh, opinions of what the adversity uh and what increases crime or what reduces crime uh, but i certainly know that the uh acts of violence have certainly happened just in the pockets of poverty uh and there is a uh, characteristic of those who are committing these crimes, uh, unemployed, lack of education, no jobs, no hope. And so uh, if we can give a person a job, uh, I think we can give them hope. And so I look forward uh, to our economic development partners with the Minority Chamber in Florida West uh, because I can in good faith continue to support anything from my one-fifth that's not creating jobs uh, to help uh, with the situation. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Bender? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner May. Just uh, so you know, I, I mean, of course, I think this, the sheriff did a good job on Tuesday night. Uh, my comments thus far have been that I, I did feel like the business community was, was missing from that. And, um, you know, I, I know we focused a lot on the kids. And just like with high school graduation rates, you can't focus on seniors in high school to get that up. Absolutely. So, so I understand the need to focus on on youth sports and give them activities where they they don't fall into um, certain behaviors and things like that. But I, but in hearing that, you know, the young twenties are the are the ones committing the crimes. I feel like we do need to try to also focus on on that area, um, and and that might be through the jobs and and uh, opportunities for that. So, um, I, I know we'll we'll talk to the chamber and and things like that to in that regard right and, and absolutely we know that this the end result of a systemic problem i mean starts at a very young age but the reality of it is you know some would want you to believe that you know it's just children killing each other but when you look at the average age i mean a youth program is not going to stop an adult from killing an adult and so there are some bad stereotypes but we do know that if we I'll give people jobs and they're getting up at five o'clock in the morning going to work and they're involved in their community, they probably are less likely uh, to commit an act of violence. And so um, for me, you know, I don't think that there's one solution, Robert. I mean, we can have as many roundtables as we want, uh, but from my position, we have to do job creation and align it with our educational strategies. Uh, and with our economic development strategies, and it's not a silo of just county commissioners. I mean, you and I both sat in Civicon, uh, you know, to listen at how horrible the commissioners are. Uh, but unless we work with our school district, I mean, today, I mean, at the Department of Education, uh, we have one school uh, at, at Warrington that's on the chopping blocks, and we have another school at O.J. Sims that's on the chopping blocks today in Tallahassee. Uh, and the end result of those schools being on the chopping blocks uh, is the result of crime and negative activity that happens in our community. So collaboratively, uh, we have to look at, in my opinion, different strategies in which we can support, whether they're vocational or whether they're workforce, uh, to make sure that we don't have to worry about every child getting a PhD or master's degree to get a job. I mean, we should, at somewhat, from our economic development side, that's our side, the educational side is the school system. From the economic development side, we should be creating jobs for the citizens who pay taxes in Escambia County and not creating jobs that we have to import people from outside our community to take those jobs while the very people who live here continue to be displaced. And so that's the conversation for me. Thank you, Commissioner May. Uh, Commissioner Underhill, you're recognized. Um, you'd mentioned that a number of commissioners have time constraints out of respect for their time. Nothing to add? 
Okay, thank you. Um, I have a few things I, I, I neglected to mention. I should have included Officer Ray in my moment of silence. That's a terrible tragedy. What happened to um, our Scammy County deputy and his daughter? We're praying for her recovery, um, and we're all mourning the loss of Master Deputy Ray. Um, I mentioned Terry Thrash. That's a tremendous loss to the community, tremendous loss to his family, and hundreds, hundreds of people who he has uh, taught the great game of tennis to. Um, also want to thank and commend our sheriff, Chip Simmons, for really taking the bull by the horns and, and really taking on a very, very difficult task of uh, the violence and some of the cultural things that are happening that have led to um, the gun violence that we've seen. Uh, it, was, it was a good conversation. I was frankly somewhat disappointed that there wasn't more of a turnout. Um, if you counted the media and the, the members of the uh, law enforcement community and the people on the panel, um, that number uh, exceeded the number of citizens who sat in there. So that was somewhat disappointing. I'm glad for the ones that showed up. Lots of big ideas out there. Um, I like to be a guy that focuses on um, what I believe are the fundamental core issues. Um, 10 years on the school board, we went from 12 career academies because I believe that we don't have a one-size-fits-all method for student success. And we went from 12 career academies to over 60. All kinds of fields, all kinds of careers. So those opportunities are there. Um, we have a very successful culinary arts program at Pine Forest High School. We've got a number of good uh, options at Pensacola High School. And I know that the director of workforce education in the schools um, works very hard at this. And, you know, so we, we can put programs out. We can't compel kids to partake. I strongly agree that sports have a place in all of this. But it's not the, it's not the, it's not the be all, end all. It's not the ultimate solution. Um, depending upon what sport it is, what are the core values that you learn in sports? If it's judo, you're trying to beat your opponent using his force. If it's tennis, I want to beat the guy on the other side of the court. If it's football, you want to win and you want to hit people hard. Um, that's great, and it's great for taking out the excess energy of a kid going through puberty, but I don't know that the core values uh, are coming through, and I don't know that they're sticking, because sadly you see a lot of young men who played football uh, appearing before the judge. You know, I was a great football player. I was a great baseball player. I think it's important to talk about other programs, and I didn't hear one of these mentioned. How about Future Business Leaders of America? How about the Key Club? How about Junior Achievement? How about the Boy Scouts of America? Boy Scouts of America. I might be a nerd, but I was in the Boy Scouts, made it all the way to life, and I learned a lot of lessons. And I don't hear about Boy Scouts going out and murdering other Boy Scouts. So I think there's a lot of meat on the bone, and I think there's a lot of work to be done. But the first thing we have to do is we have to have the courage to talk about what's really going on. And I did say it. I was one of the first speakers. The family unit in the United States of America has been devastated. 1960, it was 10%. 10% babies born out of wedlock. That's it, 10%. Now, it's 40%. It's quadrupled. That's what the latest numbers from the CDC from 2021. Some communities, it's even higher. I can speak about this because I spent the first 10 years of my life without a dad. My dad walked out. And I know the devastation um, that comes from not having a dad. I got adopted when I was 10, and I thought my dad was the meanest guy out there. Meanest, meanest guy. Made me, made me tell him where I was going, who I was going to be there with, looked at my report card, made sure I did my homework, looked out for me. I would have been a statistic. I would have been a statistic if it wasn't for that man adopting me. So I won't hear any of it that it doesn't matter. I heard a couple panelists say, well, it doesn't matter. Some women are strong and they can overcome, but they can't do it alone and it ain't fair to ask them to. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about, big picture, let's incentivize families staying together. Let's work with our state and federal representatives. Let's end the marriage penalty. Let's end these ridiculous practices where you separate families and take away their vouchers if the dad comes back. That's what we gotta do, because everything else is good, is well intended, but it will not solve the issue. The American family, a two-parent household, that's how kids succeed. 
And if you're born with, if you're born into a situation like I was, and you don't got a dad, it's trouble, especially for men, especially for males. So we could talk about any program you want. I'm on board. We could talk about technology. I think technology is on its way. I think it will end the day of the common criminal. I think there's stuff that we're going to deploy we don't even know yet. Drones that can film entire cities. And then when a shot goes off or someone's raped, they play back the tape, they follow them to the house, and we arrest the criminals. Violent criminals, technology is going to get you. So if witnesses don't corroborate, that's OK. We'll have drone footage, we'll follow you to your house, and we'll arrest you. Meanwhile, we've got to look at the big picture. And we've got to do something that's going to take decades, decades to fix. And that's putting the family back together. I'm sorry to take time on that. But Jeff, it's important and, and, for me to take time when I have a podium to do so. Lumen, you're right. And, and I'm glad you have that podium, Jeff. I mean, you would probably be opposite. I mean, because, you know, I think it's unfair to, you know, criminalize football players when, I, don't. I, I mean, you know, you know, boys and girls, I mean, boy scouts. I mean, I tell you what, that's a long criminal record of many of them as well. I mean, and so there's no one answer if we had that there answer, is. Jeff. I mean, you know, in 1977, there were, there were more blacks killed by blacks than killed in the Vietnam War. I mean, so it's a systemic oppression, racism, disenfranchised, uh, unsuccessful, well-intended, ill-will government programs. And yes, so yes. when we really have that conversation inside of stereotype people, uh, poverty breeds poverty. And yeah. so it, 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 what we should be, in my opinion, focus on the elevator out of poverty, the, the, the bridge, you know, over the situation that they're in. And because if we continue to just identify that, you know, it's just a, a, a black problem or urban, it's an American problem. It's a cultural problem. I mean, it, rather, if you have a murder, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to solve that murder. And so I think in our human services decide as a county, what we have the ability to do is just control what we can control. And that is to put more of our resources into prevention. And so I'm this will be a committee of the whole, and you'll probably never completely agree, because I, I agree, you know, we want the family structure to be intact, uh, but in many times, uh, that doesn't happen, and when you look at the divorce rate, you know, among white America, I mean, it's horrible, so it's a, a, it's a lot of kids in single family homes, and it has, uh, this crime really has uh, no significance just based on race, I guarantee you when you do the correlation, it has a lot to do with poverty. Lots of poverty. Well, yeah, and so and Lumen, I, and I appreciate that, and I, I certainly am not pointing out or trying to stigmatize any particular race. Again, I gave you my testimony. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I know. I'm I mean, a white you know, man. I may be a little sensitive. I mean, I'm sure you got some tennis players that do some bad stuff too. Well, we and do. I'm sure there's some football players, and you got some track people. I mean, the swimmers are the worst. I mean, so I mean, we can we could we could stereotype all day. You know what yeah. I mean? And I'm, I'm not I'm not interested in doing that. I'm interested in finding solutions for kids because I care about kids. That's what I'm about. And so um, I certainly want to make it clear that I'm not stigmatizing any race. I said it at the round table, and I meant it. This issue transcends race. And when you look at the acceleration of the uh, decimation of the American family, it's, it's acute in the, right, in the white community right now. The highest rates are, are in the white community. So it transcends race. So I don't care if you're Hispanic, black, white, Asian. Um, if you're born into a family without a father, you're behind the eight ball. Take it from me. I learned it the hard way, and I've seen the results of it. And so we can talk about a lot of things. And Lumen, I'm going to be right there with you. Anything we can do for kids, programs, support, I would simply say for the last 50 years, a lot of that has been tried. And a lot of it hasn't worked. So I would prefer to focus on things that could work. And if possible, I'd like to put families back together. If you look at cancer, look at lung cancer. You know, everyone knows what causes it. How did we, how did we lower the rates? Well, we started intense public uh, uh, service campaigns, and we talked about cigarette smoking, and we've lowered the cigarette smoking rate among Americans significantly, and lung cancer instances have come down as well. These are tough problems, and you got to talk about them. So we got to talk about families, and I'm going to talk about families, because if you have two parents, you you have a less likelihood of, of devolving into violent crime. I mean, we could go a lot of different directions with it, but I'm going to support whatever we can. Technology for the communities where we have a lot of crime, cameras, drones, technology. We got to build more prisons. A lot of people are going to go to jail, but we've got to make our community safe. And I'm committed to giving the sheriff any resource he needs to make that happen in Escambia County. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to go out to our Waste Services Department for an employee appreciation event. 
Uh, it was great to be there and, and visit with the employees and eat some good smoked chicken and sausage and just fellowship for a little bit. They're doing a great job out there, uh, encouraging the job that Don Sites is doing out there, not just work related to the technical part, but also the team building and the employee morale. So Don, I really appreciate that. Also, I want to uh, give kudos to Michael Rhodes and our Parks Department. I know Commissioner Barry mentioned the SEC event coming up. Michael and his department has been spent many, many hours uh, with the SEC and out at Brosenham preparing for that event that starts a week from Sunday. Uh, so, you know, I, I know one thing, when I hand something to Michael Rhodes, you know it's going to be handled, it's going to be handled well, and he's a great representative uh, for Scammy County and for the board, so I appreciate him and his team. And also, the Pensacola Interstate Fair starts today, this afternoon, and I'm pleased to announce that your HR staff and, and labor relations staff have coordinated, us, coordinated for us to have a booth they're at the Interstate Fair, so we can do recruiting and just kind of tell our story. So various directors will be manning the booth and staff. And so I, I just want to recognize uh, Crystal and Nikki and, and Jerry and, and all the staff that worked to make that come, bring that to fruition. And with that, that's all I have. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Commissioner Barry. County Administrator, I appreciate you mentioning that. While uh, if anybody does take part in, in walking around in some of the booths out there, if they uh, peruse the Pine Meadow Elementary Art Fair, there'll be a first grader. Who's got, who's, got, uh, who's got some art displayed. Sloanberry is, uh, we went out last Thursday for the, for the kickoff event out at the, out at the fairgrounds where they uh, you know, have all the art teachers and parents and young people out there. So if you're, uh, if you're walking around and you're uh, uh, you know, going to the, the Skimmy County HR booth and you happen upon the Pine Meadow booth, then that would be good. Can we bid on it? Is it for sale? Every, every, everything is for sale, everything as, as we've all learned. Everything is for sale. If uh, it, it will end up in my office, if, if not. So. Hey, Mr. I, Bender, I, I just want to say, uh, hockey starts tonight. O opening opening night at the uh, at the Bay Center, um, and uh, so the puck drop, drops puck drops tonight. Who are they playing? I, I don't know. I just know it's the first game tonight. <laughs> Thanks for all that information, Robert. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, and I didn't, and, and Trevor and Turner are really um, helpful this weekend, but I do want to thank our PIO staff, Michael Rose, uh, this weekend. You know, I, I, there's no denying that, you know, athletics and sports is a, a part of my life. And um, so Parks and Recs is very important. And, but to our PIO department, uh, you can call them at the, you know, drop of a dime and they're there. And so I want to compliment Dave and his team because they're always there. They're incredible. Yeah. <laughs> They're fantastic. Thank you for, for giving the, the credit that they deserve. All right, the chair would entertain a motion on the slate of proclamations. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Motion is second on the proclamations. Please vote. All right, gentlemen, that passes unanimously. Three of these we are ratifying. We're ratifying the uh, proclamation congratulating Andrea Boyd on her retirement. We're ratifying the proclamation commending Elizabeth Eckford for her remarkable contributions to civil rights. And we're ratifying the proclamation honoring and congratulating Zion Hope Primitive Baptist Church on its longevity. But we are presenting a proclamation um, declaring October 2022 as Florida Native Plant Month in Escambia County. And uh, to present that, I will present the proclamation to Claire. I believe Claire Davis is here today. And who is that that's with you? Kimberly Bradner, I'm the president. Kimberly. Kimberly Bradbury? It's Bramner. Bramber. Bramner. I can't, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce that. But Kimberly is here as well. We're going to present this. <laughs> I'm going to read this proclamation. Whereas Florida's native plants and plant communities are rich and diverse, are essential in the natural environment in sustaining bees, butterflies, and other animals, and thus provide benefits to Escambia County citizens that cannot be overstated and must be preserved for future generations. And whereas Florida, and particularly Escambia County, has an incredible wealth of natural areas to showcase our native plant communities to the citizens and visitors, and whereas Escambia County, Florida enjoys over 1,500 species of native trees, shrubs, vines, and wildflowers, including panhandle lily, eight types of blazing star, 22 species of orchids, 
three varieties of native azaleas, the rare needle palm, 16 species of carnivorous plants that are primarily located in protected pitcher plant prairie, that's a tongue twister, and 11 types of milkweeds necessary for the monarch butterfly. All of these species of plants support ecotourism by drawing visitors from all over the world to those unique places within our county where the abundance of our native flora can be admired. And whereas Escambia County is home to Florida and national champion trees, an example is the Huffman Live Oak, located in West Escambia County, as well as American Beach and Bald Cypress, which are fundamental trees. Miles of county roadways are graced with wildflowers, which support the pollinators that benefit the local agriculture industry. And whereas the Longleaf Chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society, whose mission is the conservation, preservation, and restoration of native plants and plant communities, serves Escambia County and is helping keep Escambia County natural. Now, therefore be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County, Florida, declares the month of October 2022 as Native Florida Native Plant Month in Escambia County, Florida, and calls upon all residents to celebrate the natural diversity of our beautiful landscape. Board of County Commissioners of Scammy County, Florida, Jeff Bergosh, Chairman, District 1, Doug Underhill, Vice Chairman, District 2, Lumen May, District 3, Robert Bender, District 4, and Stephen Berry, District 5. Thank you. Would you like to say some words? I'd just like to thank all the commissioners because this is a important step in bringing native plant awareness to the public. And um, we really appreciate you passing this proclamation. All right, moving forward in our agenda. Uh, did the clerk's office receive the proofs of publication for the public hearings on the agenda and the board's weekly meeting schedule? Mr. Chairman, the clerk's office has received all proofs. Fantastic. Move that we waive the reading of the proofs. Second. Motion to second to waive the reading. Please vote. Motion to waive the reading passes unanimously. Next up, the clerk's, uh, clerk and comptroller's report. Cody Lee, you're recognized. Yes, there are uh, three items on the clerk's report. The first is acceptance of TDT uh, collection data. Uh, that data represents for fiscal year uh, 22, about 21.8 million was uh, received or collected. That represents a 23% increase over the prior uh, fiscal year. Items two and three our uh, recommendation concerning filing of uh, documents, minutes, and reports. Move the clerk's report. Second. Motion is second to move the clerk's report. Please vote. Clerk's report passes unanimously. Growth Management, Horace Jones, you're recognized. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Board Members. For today, we have two final plats. We have first final plat, Mills Lake Estates. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Is all well with Mills Lake Estates? Yes, sir. Okay. Ms. Uh, and there's, are there any speakers? Uh, I don't believe we have any speakers, no. Okay. I understand. I move the item A and B. Second. Okay, motion is second to move the item. Seeing no discussion, please vote. And that passes unanimously. Item two. Item two is Allison Acres for final plat approval. Mr. Mr. Chairman, any speakers? See no speakers. All right, Mr. Chairman, I need to abstain. I'll go ahead and read this. Okay. This is in um, your district. I'm prepared to pass the gavel. Make the motion. Thank if you. I'm happy to make. Okay. I, Stephen Berry, hereby disclose on October 20, 2022, a measure came or will come before my agency, which inures to the special gainer loss of Todd and Pam Stafford. The measure before my agency and the nature of conflicting interest in the measure is as follows. Escambia County Board of County Commissioners meeting 10 20 2022 Growth Management Report Action Item 1-2. Recommendation concerning Allison Acres Permit FP 2209-4287, P 
PSD-FP. Todd Stafford, the agent for the applicant, is a client of mine which creates a conflict of interest pursuant to statute 112.3143 Florida statutes where the appearance of a conflict of interest pursuant to statute 286.012 Florida statutes. Okay, the chair would entertain a motion on this topic. Second. Motion is second on this topic. Please vote. Item passes four to uh, one with Commissioner Barry, actually four zero with Commissioner Barry abstaining from the vote. All right, moving forward, uh, County Administrator's report. Wes, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are three items on the technical public service consent agenda and there are no changes. All right, I do not believe that we have any speakers, but let me just double check, refresh my computer. See no speakers. Move no speakers. the technical public service consent. Second. second. Okay, a motion and a second. Please vote. That item passes uh, unanimously. All right, West. There are 33 items on the budget finance consent agenda. Please make the following changes. Drop card 2-14, the recommendation concerning the Florida Department of Health statement of work for the coordinated opioid recovery effort and hold for speakers card 2-11. And in addition, I need to hold 2-4 so that I can abstain from that vote. I too have a voting conflict um, and I've got my form here. So we need to hold 2-4 as well. And I believe, uh, do we have any? Mr. Yes. Mr. Chairman, on item 31, I'd like to add $3,000 for my discretionary to the uh, uh, communities carrying at Christmas, WAR. Okay, hang, hang on, let me go over there. Thanks, um, Commissioner Berry. That's, and um, I'm gonna add another, because it's such a great program that WAR and Sue Strong does at Community Care, and I know they have a need. I'm gonna add, I already had 8,500. I'm gonna add another 1,500 to that. Okay, so Stevens adding uh, to number 31, Stevens adding 3,000. And I'm going to add an additional 1,500 to what I've, on top of what I've already put in there. I don't. Okay, okay, 1,500. And I'm going to join the party with 1,000 as well. Um, so I'm sure WAR would appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so any other items on here that we need to pull? No, sir, I, I do want to mention, I, I just want to mention one before we vote on it. There's an item of allocation for first place partners, and it's for $1,500. It's, uh, I want to recognize Dave Merzen for uh, being willing to putting, to putting together uh, one, one part of the eventual grant application for Department of Economic Opportunity broadband grant programs is going to be, uh, is going to be having, you know, some public meetings and, and those kind of things. And, and Dave and uh, Ed Carson, I believe, are organizing those. I think there's going to be three of them in the north end where they just go and, uh, you know, go and be the head complaint takers about it for, you know, an hour, which I do, uh, which I do appreciate Dave being willing to do that. And, uh, you know, it's a, I think it's a good spot for first place partners. As, I, as they are helping Escambia County, I do believe that they're going to be working with Santa Rosa County as well trying to help them navigate uh, some of the grant process. So I just want to recognize that. And if there are no speakers, Mr. Chairman, I would move oh. the balance of it. Um, Jeff, I want to tag on a, a 500 to that golden elite that you were doing. Uh, oh, fantastic, uh, yes. That's yeah. very worthwhile. Yeah. 33. Gentlemen, before we take that motion, uh, we have just had a, a number of uh, items from this that we have a, one speaker who wants to speak to each of them. So um, let, me, let me recap it, and then you make sure I got it right. 23, 24, 214, we're dropping. 211, 231, 227, 28, 29, 30, 32, and 33. We have speakers for, we now have one speaker for all those items. So the chair would entertain a motion on the balance. Can, can you just Miss repeat those real quick? Can you just repeat them real quick? Yes. Or slowly two, repeat them. 23, 24, dropping 214. We're holding 211, 231. 227, 228, 229, 230, 231, 232, and 233, so that one speaker can speak to each item. And Mr. Chairman, the addition from Commissioner May, it was $500 on car 227, the golden elite Yes, ma'am. Golden elite, okay. yeah. Appreciate that. Just maybe. making sure we got that. Thank okay. You. So now the chair would entertain a revised So motion. move, Mr. Chairman. Second. Motion to second on the balance. Please vote.
Okay, the balance passes unanimously. <laughs> There's not much of a balance, but it passed. Now we're gonna go one by one. Two dash three. Wes, do you wanna set the table? This is contract reward for the archeological survey at OLF eight. This is something we uh, agreed to when we did the land swap with the Navy. Mm -hmm. And so this is putting in, uh, actually bring to fruition that archeological survey, survey that we agreed to perform upon acceptance of this property. Fantastic, and we have one speaker, Larry Downs Jr. You're recognized. Larry Downs Jr. Uh, I just wanted to remind y'all that, uh, you know, this, this OLL, OLF 8 is uh, it's not, uh, it's really not a limited uh, governance type of thing. I mean, you got outside agencies that you're funneling money through or to. Uh, you know, I guess this is for some type of study for rocks and arrowheads and stuff. Make sure there's none out there, I guess. Uh, but it's really like being in the real estate business. You know, everything that y'all engage in uh, with this property is something that normally developers would do. Developers, sometimes the same, similar developers as to what y'all say they can't do. It's kind of ironic. Anyways, I just wanted to point out to the people that uh, that this is um, this is really not a limited government uh, issue. It's an unlimited government issue. So amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We're going to take a motion on 2 3. Second. Motion is second to approve 2 3. Please vote. All right, that passes 4 0 with Commissioner Underhill off the dais. Okay, we're moving to uh, item 2 4, and I am going to go ahead and abstain. Um, I'll do that before the motion is made. Um, I'm filing an 8B form today, a memorandum of voting a conflict for county, municipal, and or other local public officers. The reason for my abstention is the county uh, administrator's report item 11-4, the recommendation concerns fiscal year 2022-2023 miscellaneous appropriations agreements for outside agencies. My wife, Sally Bergash, is the executive director of the Health and Hope Clinic, which creates a conflict of interest pursuant to section 112.3143 Florida statutes or an appearance of a conflict of interest pursuant to 286.012 Florida statutes. Again, I've signed my form and I've dated it and now I'm going to pass it down. Doug, will you pass that down? All right, Chair, would I entertain a motion on item four? I think there's a speaker. Oh, we have a speaker? Okay, we have a motion and a second, but we do have a speaker. Larry Downs Jr., you're recognized. <clears throat> Larry Downs Jr., uh, another recusal. Hmm. It's interesting how a lot of the things that y'all are voting on or each other are voting on for the other uh, may or may not have a conflict or an appearance of a conflict. It's just weird that y'all make me look bad to the public telling me that I should not recuse myself when on this very item, you're doing it for an indirect conflict. No, it's a direct monetary conflict. So you're going to benefit from the county giving this money to them? I'm not. Your wife is? Yeah. Yep. So you are. Isn't that interesting? Anyways, I'm just pointing out the obvious. Uh, you know, if I hadn't been in business so long, y'all suggesting that I did something wrong. Uh, would affect me. That's why a lot of people don't get involved with our government for fear of retaliation. And it's interesting. Anyways, thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. And Mr. Chairman, can I yeah. just confirm that motion was so moved from Commissioner Barry and second from Commissioner May? I just wanted to make sure we had it. Thank you, Great. sir. All right, please vote.
That item passes uh, four to zero with myself abstaining due to the obvious conflict. And before we move uh, to the next item, um, I just want to state for the record um, the reasons why I abstain when the Health and Hope Clinic uh, items come before this board. My wife was recruited uh, to run that organization as the executive director for the last three years. And just in case someone doesn't know what they do, they provide free, free health care, free. They don't bill Medicaid, not one dime. They provide free dental services to people who don't have any dental insurance. You know, people who are having impacted teeth and can't go see a dentist. They do it for free. They have 300 doctors, dentists that work for free and they save the county millions of dollars. Last year they did five million in free medical and dental to homeless people, people of color, veterans, free. These people otherwise would be in the emergency rooms of this county and those people would, it would result in Medicaid being billed which our Medicaid reimbursement rate from the county has gone up exponentially. Talk to Stephen Hall. In 2006, it was a million dollars county taxpayers were paying for uninsured medical. It's now running around five million. So the Health and Hope Clinic, where my wife was recruited to run, has geometrically expanded what they do, which saves the county money. Now, why do I, uh, why do I say that and why do I abstain? I abstain because I have to. My wife makes money, but what they do, the mission, is worthwhile and it saves the county money. If tomorrow she was recruited to work at another nonprofit that this board funds, I would also abstain, but it wouldn't be corrupt or it wouldn't be a problem because they allow this in statute so that the family members of people who step up to serve are not handcuffed in their public, in what they want to do in the public and in the workplace. So I say that for a number, about 12 people on one Facebook site and for Mr. Downs. Thank you. All right, next up. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I heard earlier that there's a hard stop, I guess, at 11. Yeah, it looks some like. Some of the board members, uh, item 3-4 would require a super, super majority vote. Okay, so the chair would, we, you, you would like to move forward? Yeah, let's move to 3-4 and then we'll come back to these, these other items. So let's move up to 3-4. Let's take a look. So this is the property that we're looking at acquiring for the community center and ferry pass. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and so we did have two appraisals done. Uh, UWF had to get their appraisal done, which came in significantly higher than ours. Um, so we had ours uh, updated because it had been some time since they had, had uh, uh, been completed. And we took the average of those two and then averaged it with UWFs. And uh, which I believe is uh, about 2% higher than the average, uh, the, the, than what our average was. Um, and so uh, in speaking with UWF, it, it, uh, we, we've ag agreed um, in principle, uh, of course, up to their board to vote, but it uh, seems like there's support for, the, for the, this use of the facility and, and um, and uh, they're, they're excited to see something well, coming to the front. Man, I'm excited for you. Of course, I'm going to support it, but Allison has something I she wants. I just need to yep. clarify if, before you vote, it is actually with the UWF Foundation, not the trustees. They're actually two separate boards. Okay. All right. So um, with that stated, the chair would entertain a motion. This is something that requires a supermajority vote. I see there's four of us up here. That qualifies. So uh, the chair would entertain a motion. Uh, move the item in the affirmative. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second on the floor. Please vote. Okay, that passes 4-0 with a supermajority with Commissioner Underhill leaving the dais. All right, we're gonna go back backwards now. We're gonna go to uh, item 2-11. We're gonna go through these one by one. 2-11 has a speaker. Um, yeah, we got Larry Downs Jr. You're recognized. Hello, commissioners. Larry Downs Jr. Uh, this is a recommendation concerning the uh, what is that insurance of a purchase order 
in excess of $25,000, which I believe it's a couple million dollars. Uh, for the medical examiner and uh, I think uh, some of that money should be used by the medical examiner to research these uh, these uh, mRNA Pfizer Moderna AstraZeneca Johnson & Johnson adverse reactions and deaths A friend of mine died from after after five Five weeks after getting his Moderna booster, he had a major stroke. Good friend of mine, over 25 years. And uh, this is happening all around the world. Our CDC just just uh, put on the immunization schedule for children to get this mRNA for it to be utilized or required or which some states will require it. Meanwhile, the UK uh, doesn't doesn't advise it for anyone under 12. Our Florida Surgeon General doesn't advise it for anyone under, I think he said 15 or 18, but I'm sure he'll change that to anyone at some point whenever there's enough documented. But they don't know because they didn't check if it caused his death or not. When I asked them, the doctor and the nurses, what do they think the odds are that it had something to do with the vaccines, the two or the third shot? They said, no, it doesn't have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. I said, how do you know? I don't know, how do you know? I said, well, people have strokes for all kinds of reasons. I said, yeah, and, and? the mRNA jabs, <laughs> it does. I mean, I know nobody wants to hear it. It's that mass formation stuff. You know, everybody panicked, got hysterical. Even people in this room got hysterical. The whole time I sit right here doing this and y'all scolded me for touching the, the mic, touching this podium. Meanwhile, nothing's changed. Can y'all imagine how many flu deaths we would have had every year if they were encouraged and incentivized to test for it for everybody on hospice, people in wrecks, and list coded as COVID death or coded as influenza death? All right, you're done. Lot. You're done. Thank you. You're done. Hey, um, I have a suggestion. We have the same speaker for one, two, three, four, five, six. I got a better one, seven, for seven discretionary allocations. So here's what we're gonna do. The chair would entertain a motion on those items together, and then we'll allow the speaker to come up and we'll economize. Chair would, chair, oh yeah, we gotta do that one first. Item 11, motion second on 11, please vote. We're gonna economize a little bit. We got a, we got a deadline to meet. All right, item 11 passes four to zero. Chair would entertain a motion on 27 through 33. Motion to second on 27 through 33. Larry, you recognize for three minutes. They're all the same. So you're, you're recognized. Yeah, that's fine with me. I'm glad. Kind of, kind of getting tired of pointing out the obvious anyways. Y'all get the gist of it. <laughs> uh, this one in particular, of course all of them, but this one in particular, funding allocation for WAR3. Channel 3, the disingenuous reporting station. Of course, they're not the only ones. They're owned by Sinclair. Uh, they're all doing the same thing. That's what got you all scared. That's what, uh, after a little while, finally got uh, one of y'all to wear a mask, then two, and then three, even outdoors. It was a weird murmur. Y'all closed the outdoors. Closed it. It's dangerous to be outside on the beach. All right. Uh, is this funding... You know, uh, I think it's coming from what's been known as the slush fund. Do you think this could appear to, you know, be something like a, like a, give me some uh, good news coverage. Look at what we're doing. We're helping, helping y'all, helping uh, with, with WAR3's PR program. Because they need PR too. Y'all need PR, they need PR. However, it's our tax dollars. 
paying for this type of PR. It's interesting. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, all, all the other different things that, that this slush fund goes to, to uh, how about this, uh, you know, how about this uh, the school here, Pine Meadow? Do any of y'all have any kids in that school? You know, uh, could that be a recusal? I mean, it's that's votes. That's votes. Hey, my kid goes to this school, uh, and we're doing these good things with other people's money. Vote for me. Vote re reelect me. It, it's I'm, we know this. Everybody in this room knows this. And I wouldn't be here if y'all didn't tell me I did a wrong thing. I didn't do a wrong thing. Maybe some of y'all should recuse yourself or what do you call it, abstain for an appearance. An appearance. Y'all don't even know what kind of text messages I have with Mr. Banks. You got no clue. You didn't ask. He would have had grounds. He would have had grounds for a, an appeal had I been on there influencing. Either way, either way. And uh, sacrificial lamb, that's what uh, Melissa called me. Y'all made me a sacrificial lamb. Well, one, I'm not a lamb. And two, at least she, she's seen what it was. <laughs> it's interesting, so now what? <laughs> I'm just pointing out the obvious. And I try to, I tr I try to keep everything as above board as possible. I try to, y'all know me. And it's, it's clear that there was some intended animosity, and that's the reason why I was voted off that board. Y'all know that. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, vote. Yeah, we got a vote on the slate. Please vote. We have a motion to second. So already. this is items 27 through 30. 31, 33 through 33. And that passes unanimously. Okay, we're moving up to discussion items. We'll take them one by one. Wes, do you want to start off? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the number one is concerning the appointment to the West Florida Library Board of Governance. Uh, our previous um, appointee declined, and so this is appointing a replacement. Chair, would entertain a motion? So I, I um, move to appoint uh, Liza Campbell. Second. Motion to second. Please vote. All right, that passes unanimously. Um, next item, I requested that this be put on yep. the agenda uh, at the last TDC meeting. Um, the discussion evolved about Roger Scott hosting regional and worldwide tennis tournaments and the potential impact uh, that has on tourism. Um, a request was made uh, to the TDC to partially fund a portion of the Roger Scott resurfacing project, potentially with TDT funds um, however statutorily that requires that this board um, authorize that we spend tdt funds to conduct a study with the uwf to uh, illustrate or demonstrate um, what that benefit to tourism would be so i was asked to put this on there to get that ball rolling and, and that's what i've done um, robert you know i know that's your district and uh, it's a very important um, uh, asset to the community actually to the whole region because um, when they do those uh, those tournaments, you have people from all around the world coming to Pensacola. So, of course, uh, I'm, I'm eager to see what the benefit is to tourism. I've already supported uh, this county's expenditure of $1.3 million to help uh, assist with that project because I think it's that beneficial uh, to the community. So, um, at this point, you know, I would I would I would like to get a motion in a second to conduct the study using TDT funds uh, to illustrate the benefit. And that's why I brought it. Otherwise, the project is not going to move. It's probably not going to move forward. Stefan, you want to say something? Yes, sir. Commissioners, also, I just want to point out that this does require a two-thirds vote of the board. Oh, it per, does. Per the statute. Just, just to order the study? To move, to move forward. So you can still do the study, but 
uh, to to actually allocate those funds, it is a two thirds vote. So I, I think that'll happen separately. I was going to say, yeah, I think the board. This should, is just today to start should, the study. It should just be the study. That's all I'm um, asking for, guys. Yeah, because otherwise, uh, that, I mean, that's part of what the audit brought up was was that we didn't have the information when we took precisely. The vote. So uh, I, I can make the motion to to uh, uh, fund the study, um, but with that, I think that given uh, maybe the commitment from this board to to potentially fund another 1.5 to 1.9 out of TDT, in addition to the 1.3 we've already already um, allocated uh, for, for this project, uh, I think that the Escambia County citizens should start paying the same rate as the city of Pensacola players immediately. Oh, that's, that's that, not a bad that idea. Would, that would be something I'm gonna work on with the city, uh, and I, I think that, uh, I mean, we've made the commitment, and I think we should go ahead and start to, to have the, the benefit. I thought that was already the case. That yeah, was, I did too. I mean, that was that it, was part of the 1.3. Well, that was 1.3. That once it was done, that they would have the same rate. But I think they can start paying well, the same rate today. I mean, I, I mean, from my point of view, it's going to be disingenuous for me to support doing this study. I'm not going to support more money going over there. I mean, the city of Pensacola, if they want to pay for a study, um, I mean, they have they have they have revenue, they have reserves, they have they have funds. Yeah, if this is such a high priority. To the city, I mean, it's it's still a city asset, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, I feel like I've been very supportive, allocating ARPA funds that could have gone many, many places. Yep. Setting aside 1.3 million to go there already, um, I think that showed a tremendous amount of partnership to go to a to go to a, a city-owned asset that's run by a private entity. Um, I think that's a lot of good faith. I think that's a lot of exhibition of uh, exhibition of collegial, um, you know, partnership and and, and working together. Um, um, you know, the, the, I don't see the point of supporting doing a study that I'm not going to eventually support the vote to actually allocate, uh, to ask them to allocate the money over there. If the city wants to fund the study as, uh, you know, as documentation for the benefit and then, you know, bring it back, um, you know, then we will entertain, you know, like you said, Mr. Chairman, whatever, you know, whatever a chairman wants to put on the agenda, you know, the board will entertain. So if they want to move forward with it and entertain it that way or bring it back that way, then, you know, I'll, I'll discuss it again then. But I just can't, I can't imagine, uh, you know, being supportive of it if, again, if, you know, we have increased revenue this year. I mean, we have increased expenses, but we have increased revenue. The city of Pensacola is experiencing the same type of increase of revenue. And if it's, uh, if this is such a huge priority, then it should be uh, it should be taken up on that side. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Barry. Um, uh, uh, so let's let's talk about this before we move forward. I, I, before you spoke, I think Robert had made a, a motion. Um, Robert, did you make a motion on this? Okay. Was there a second? Okay, I'll second it for continued discussions. Um, uh, you're recognized, Lumen, and then you'll be recognized, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Robert, I think it could be more due diligence done in terms of, you know, the impact to uh, tourism. Uh, at this point, you know, I, I agree with my colleague uh, that it probably should, the petitioner probably should pay for the study to justify it. Um, although, as Jeff talked about football earlier, I probably don't have very many people that play tennis, but I've been very supportive, not only 1.3, uh, but we did put, I mean, I don't know, a half a million, a million into the clay court. Yes. So, I mean, we're well on top of $2.5, 3000000 million into tennis courts in the city, and I'm not saying that I couldn't support it, Jeff. Sure. I'm saying that, you know, we have issues where people get killed in Bellevue Park, and we have an egress problem out there. We have a lighting problem out there. <laughs> we have a camera problem out there. And so it's hard for me in good conscience uh, to look at Brent Ballpark and to look at those parts and the needs in Wedgwood Park uh, and support a tennis court uh, with millions of dollars right now when we've already given, you know, close to two and a half million dollars. Uh, not to say that I would be opposed to it for tourism, uh, but it certainly needs to be a, a little more conversation uh, for me before I can allocate, you know, or, or, or support that. And not to say I wouldn't, I, I don't think that this is the time to do it. Uh, when we've had those issues in our own parks. Okay, um, Doug, you're right. And I'm a big city person too, as you know. Yeah, I'll keep my comments short because I think the math is, is playing out as it should. Um, yeah, this is the strangest things that I learned about being in this office for eight years is this constant is kind of incrementally pregnant where we, where they, people come to us and they want something and they said that's all that they need. And then 
you know, they have to come back later and they ask for more and more. Um, you know, it's like if you do your research ahead of time and you figure out what it's going to cost, figure out the division of those responsibilities and get it done up front. Um, you know, that's how the rest of the grown-up world works. But you know, here it's this incrementally, you know, incremental pay, and then eventually we're we're all in, and we we've paid for the thing but own nothing. Mm -hmm. So no, I would I couldn't support. Uh, we've we've definitely been demonstrated our um, uh, commitment um, with uh, previous one, one contributions, um, which I believe is more than enough to demonstrate that we you know recognize that city residents or county residents as well. Um, so all of those other arguments that get thrown out there uh, are pretty much moot with me. Um, you know, perhaps here in a couple of weeks when I'm replaced on the board, there'll be a, another vote for that, but there certainly isn't today. All right, Robert, with that said, it well, looks like a 2-3 if well, we take the vote. So. Yeah, I, I would just like the statute says, though, that the, an independent professional analysis performed at the expense of the County Tourist Development Council. Right. Um, and so that is, uh, I mean, I understand the, the board's position. Uh, I'm just saying under statute it says that it has to come from the, the council. That, what do you mean it has to come from? The city can pay for whatever they want to pay for. Would it, I don't understand what you're saying. But uh, So in order for TDT um, uh, taxes uh, to be used towards infrastructure, uh, one of the requirements is, is that it, it has to have uh, part E is an independent professional analysis performed at the expense of the county tourist development council demonstrates the positive impact of the infrastructure project on tourist related businesses in the county. Well then I think it would be I think it would be good documentation for the for the city to prepare one to uh, uh, to make the argument at the TDC for the TDC to fund one of their own. Well that was going to be my question well, Allison does, well, does, that the TD, the, does the TDT have to fund the study or could Commissioner Bender or someone else or the city fund a study asking the question about the benefits to tourism uh, or does that study have to be funded by TDT dollars? I, I think it's clear from the statute that it does have to be paid for by TDT as directed by the TDC, but I don't see any reason why it couldn't be front incurred by the city or the county or whomever, and mm -hmm. then the TDC, if it wanted to, mm -hmm. could adopt it as its independent study and pay for it. Well, well but can, I, my understanding is they can't pay for it without us authorizing. Right, it. and that was the. They, I mean, they took. That's the why they this asked me what, to bring yeah, it. Right. And that's why I brought it. And, and they took a vote on on that. Yeah, and it was unanimous. It was unanimous. But I mean, hey, uh, I, I they asked me to bring it. I brought it. I support it. I'm a member. I pay the county rate, which is higher than the city for a family. Um, look. If, is there more than one way to skin the cat? Maybe. Can, can, can Robert fund it out of his discretion or if he wants to, or could the city fund it? I think the TDC would still have to adopt it as its own and then recommend it mm -hmm. for, but for the payment city, of it? The city could pay for it. Then they take that study Correct. to the TDC. The TDC could, could, if they voted to, adopt it as their own study, and then they could reimburse the city for the study. At that, or they could Not ask us, us voting on it, I'm sorry. They could ask us to reimburse the city for the study. My point is, but if, if the eventual need is four votes to get the allocation. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's an important point to make. You know, Jeff, I'd be more interested in holistically looking at, you know, the impact of sports tourism. I mean, we need a base center. Uh, we need it. We've been trying. We've been trying. <laughs> been trying. That's trying. right. So we're, we're trying to get a base center. We're trying to get a at Brosingham. We're trying to uh -huh. get the facility out there. So great. Tennis has an impact, but guess what? So does football. It sure does. So does basketball. Yep. And Volleyball. so does golf. Yep. You know, all right? And so let's just look at all of it. If I'd be more interested in a study that looks at everything and see what's the most impactful and what can we do. All right. Very I'm good. Mean, but I'm, uh, Robert, do you want to remove your motion or do you want to go forward with a vote that you will lose? No, I'll remove it. All right, and I'll remove my second as well. Okay, next up, uh, oh, there is a speed. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Okay, please, you're recognized. We're not going to vote on it, but you could speak on it. Well, yeah, I might vote on it again. Maybe. I'm sure it'll be brought back up. Uh, the tourism uh, taxing, so taxing them on top of tax is what it is. I've spoke before y'all before on this. I, I think it's a, uh, it's a, it's a tax to, you know, to, Favoritism, cronyism, nepotism. I'm sure there's some family people getting, you know, getting some benefits from it. Uh, it's definitely a vote, uh, a vote thing. Whenever you give away tax dollars to certain places, and then you show up with a ribbon cutting, you're like, "Look what I did for you, people asking for free stuff. <laughs> vote for me again." 
I'll give you more free stuff, free health care, free dental, free everything. <laughs> That's where we are. And it's, and it's funded from tax, from people who work. And then it's redistributed. It's not limited governments. This is a double tax on our tourists. We try to get them here, and then when we do, we say, we're gonna tax you for coming. <laughs> we're gonna double tax you, or tax you more. And then, uh, and then even some local people end up paying that tourism tax, and they're not tourists. Uh, that's not, you know, so that's kind of a, what do you call that, a misrepresentation of the tourism tax? All right, adios. All right, thank you. Navy Point Living Shoreline, we have a discussion. We have a, some backup that shows uh, some costs. We have a number of speakers, uh, so we'll go ahead and have the speakers, then we'll have the conversation. Starting with Glenn Conrad, you're recognized. Thank you, Glenn Conrad, 17 Northwest Gilliland. Um, I was here for the last discussion on this and the vote that you took, which was essentially, I think, a very limited decision space. Now, even the author of the principal study used for the decision that you took uh, it states this was not a comprehensive study, okay? So the decision space to make an action to actually have the only option available, which was remove this living shoreline, um, it's questionable in my mind. Uh, the fact that you would spend an additional, according to the agenda here tonight, or today, uh, rather another, what is it, $400,000, $420,000, in addition to the $180,000 to implement the project initially. So you're potentially going to th throw $610,000 down the drain with, with one option with a very limited decision space. That's almost incomprehensible to me. Um, additionally, by making the decision, if you do today, to remove these things without further analysis, it also shows that we have resources here that you think so little of that you won't even ask them for an analysis and a report. And I mean, the Pensacola and Perdido Bay Estuary Program. You've got people you can task for this to do a more comprehensive study, come back with multiple options, removal being one, and consider this later. There's this, this project has been in place for four years, and if you just remove it, then with nothing to follow it on, you're just going backwards to 2017 for that shoreline conditions. Okay, so those, those are kind of my concerns. Additionally, if a political body like this wants to remove these things, I'm sorry, I know I'm boring. No, 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 but, it's not uh, you, it's not you. But uh, uh, at, at this point, then you're going backwards with nothing going forward. So what are we going to do then about the shoreline? You know, resilience, erosion, water quality, marine life, you know, that has been, some of these aspects have been shown to be beneficial. So, and I'm concerned that by doing this in a political body, now you're hamstringing the estuary program when they ask for future grants. Because the grantors may know, hey, four years down the road, my money may go down the drain. Why should I give them a grant? Why should I let this estuary program become a national estuary program? So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, those are my concerns. So I would ask that you would defer a decision until you can get more information about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. Mel Pino, you recognize next. Thank you, Chairman Bagash. Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Boblets. I was so happy to see this on the agenda. I didn't see it until yesterday. Um, I planned on just kind of waving in support because I'd really love the war over the shoreline to be over. It, it's time to end this war. And the things that I'm gonna say are not out of acrimony or anger, but I think it's time that they be said because one of the things that I'd like to disabuse people from is the idea that people in Navy Point don't care about getting this out. Um, they do deeply, many of them. Why don't they come? Because they're scared. Here's the list of major retribution that our household has experienced directly as a result of advocating against this project. People see it. 
This isn't happening in a vacuum. Now, I don't think that the board has been all that aware of what's been going on, because I haven't brought all of this publicly to you. I put it on my Facebook, my neighbors see it, they experience us experiencing it. Even to this day, when um, Mr. McGee wrote um, Mr. Kirschenfeld and, and let him know about this study as a courtesy, and was there anything that he wanted to add to it, the email that goes back, Hi, David. I don't know if you are aware of the history of this project, but Mel Pino, with my last name intentionally misspelled, has been trying to get the Navy Point Living Shoreline Project removed since it was constructed almost five years ago. Everyone knows that's not true. You seem to be the newest pawn in her effort endeavor. That's a director of one of your departments answering a professional courtesy like that. So our household, within two weeks of withdrawing support for the project, there was an all-day discussion on ECW that Commissioner Underhill contributed to. D. Sanders Horton whipped it up about what kind of mace to use in my dog in the park. It went on for hours, and it ended up with people posting pictures of guns. Um, we got a cease and desist from the original planner. I've uh, talked to him now, we're fine. I'm fine with Wetland Sciences. They understand that we're not blaming Wetland Sciences for the project. We got deputies showing up to our house at one o'clock in the morning, shining lights in and telling me that it's because they got reports of a woman drowning across the street when they know that I'm an outdoor swimmer. Of course, we got our trees cut down, then we had the fake investigation cooked up by Jerry Champion that everyone knew was bogus. I got sued by the medical director with Commissioner Underhill's fingerprints all over the filings. Um, we got the nasty dredge on Gibbs Point. Um, we had the FEMA cutting off, off map of the FEMA maps across from Jesse Rigby's house that uh, Will Dunaway, and then having my name continually slandered as a liar for Thank you. five years. Thank you. That's your time. That's your time. That's Kev why people aren't coming. Kevin Wade, you're recognized. Kevin Wade, 413 Southeast Boblets. Um, yeah, the, the war um, that, that has besmirched this board and, you know, watching, watching a commissioner go ahead and berate uh, a speaker who came to speak against what he's seen. Well, David McGee came out and he did his surveys and he said, you know, I can, apparently see from the front side that this is failing when the news journal went ahead and put my videos of the fail of the backside showing at least a hundred bags that have been washed out. And David McGee had asked asked Chips Kirschenfeld for comments. Chips failed to uh, say, well, David, we went out and did a survey. We've got pictures of it. It's doing fantastic. The same way he stood up here and Commissioner Underhill said, that project is doing everything it was supposed to do. And th that project has just been a pawn for a war by someone who loves to go ahead and use his word wars. And David was on the phone when he went to the PNJ to watch the videos and he said, oh my, I had no idea it was this bad. And from the videos he said, look, you can see how even on the bottoms of these piles, the bags are failing. The bags are getting pushed out from the very bottom of this. Um, I've had so many neighbors come up to me on the path walking and saying, thank you, thank you. We, we saw what happened and 
we're so glad that these things are going out. They're gonna be gone. And a woman who I've seen for decades walking came up and said, thank you. I don't swim in the bayou. I haven't for decades, but my daughter just taught her children how to swim here, just like I taught her. And that was 10 years ago, and Thank she you, won't Kevin. now. Thank you, Kevin. Your, your time is up. Larry Downs, Jr. Larry Downs, Jr. Let me sit that right there, just so y'all can see that. Uh, yeah, these things need to go. These things need to go. They should have never been put there. Uh, it was funded with whatever, you know, tax dollars is what it was funded with. Uh, $180,000 plus, 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 whatever. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of money to take them out, of course. If we left them in there, would we spend more money on them? Of course. Forever. So uh, get rid of it. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, I've said that from day one. Uh, Melissa said that Navy Point uh, residents are scared. That's why they don't come up here, because they're scared of being retaliated against. This is, this is true. This is true. Don't think that I didn't consider that each and every time that I've went up against y'all. I mean, it's a, it's a relative fact that you got to consider. And then some people just aren't, you know, they, they just, even against their own better judgment, they're like, ah, I'm going with it. That's me. <laughs> uh, Kevin says that, uh, you know, that uh, having one or two, three commissioners berate the citizens. Well, I've had that happen to me. I mean, he said that's, that's not a good thing. I've had it happen. And uh, one of them just uh, walked out. <laughs> so, and it's been going on for years. And I'm good with it. That's fine. But don't expect me not to point it out. And, uh, and anything else that comes with it. But these things need to go. I mean, we're talking about, you're talking about a project that should have never been done to begin with. And if you leave them, I, I heard the guy who come up here first. He's like, you need more studies, more studies. Well, we done had five years worth of studies or four and a half, however long they've been up there. The study is with your eyes. You just look. And me and Douglas can just disagree on it. I mean, that's, that's fine. That's what we did in the beginning. We just disagreed. We didn't fight over it, but we disagreed on it. And that's the way it should go. You know, but we shouldn't be blaming citizens uh, for speaking out, or we, we definitely shouldn't be, uh, you know, using our influence to affect somebody else uh, or to, uh, you know, to send them messages. It's just not right. Not only is it not right, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's just immoral. Uh, Wasting our tax dollars is another thing that's immoral. It's immoral. Let's stop doing it. Y'all stop voting like a bunch of Democrats, would you? Okay, we'll do it. All right, uh, Chris Kerb, you're the final speaker. You're recognized on this topic. You want to speak, Chris? All right, I thought. <laughs> okay, never mind. All right. Navy Point Living Shoreline speaker, Chris Kerb, but okay. All right, you didn't want to speak. Okay, uh, board would entertain discussion on this. Doug, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, like a lot of issues, this has been conflated into a, a Doug Underhill issue. Um, you know, when this project went in, it went in with the, uh, the full support of this board. Um, it was uh, created and then conceived by our staff, um, you know, in conjunction with the, uh, the NIFWA folks, um, following best practices uh, all throughout the state of Florida. Um, you know, this was not a, uh, this was not a, a battlefield issue, um, and, uh, really never should have been become that. Um, so unfortunate that, you know, I mean, obviously everybody knows that I'm going to be out the first week of October at the world finals of jet ski racing, right? Place second once again in the world. Uh, can't seem to get that world championship, but it comes mighty close. Um, so for it to come up while I'm gone, and everybody knows that I'm going to be gone uh, for that week for the, the competition, 
um, you know, is truly unfortunate um, and really does sort of lend us to, and even the comments that you heard today, uh, make it very clear that this, ha this effort has everything to do with me and very little to do with the actual caliber of the project or the support of the, uh, of the community. Um, I believe I've got one more meeting and a, uh, and a cow uh, before I'm no longer representing the people of District 2. They've already selected the next person that's going to be sitting in this chair. Um, and uh, it's my understanding that he had a town hall uh, on this very subject and the overwhelming support, uh, as I understand it, was to, uh, you know, to continue with the project, uh, do the repairs that are, and the maintenance and repairs of this kind of project was actually built into it. So uh, to say that bags have failed, um, the, uh, the nets that hold the things together are supposed to be, uh, over time, are supposed to degrade as the, um, uh, as the oysters themselves uh, become the sinew that holds it together. All that's in the testing, right? Uh, but that's really not the point for today. The point for today is that uh, the proper time and place for this discussion um, should be uh, with the new commissioner sitting in this chair, uh, which is happening in a matter of weeks, so there's no cost of delay. Um, and in fact, there is a significant benefit in that delay uh, in that if the discussion does go to removal, um, then you know, those who are opposed to the removal will not be able to say that it was specifically, you know, it was just part of the anti-Doug efforts that, uh, that Mel's been engaged in. Um, you know, certainly while, uh, you know, what Chip said was, uh, you know, might not have been, uh, uh, you know, as, as comfortable as people would like. I mean, just to say that it's untrue would be a fallacy. We know that that's been, you know, that, that everything he said in that email was absolutely accurate. Um, so. I would strongly recommend the board give the opportunity for the new commissioner to uh, representing the people of District 2, the people most affected by this project, um, to have the opportunity to lead that discussion when he gets here in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Chips, did you want to, or Tim, did you guys want to come forward and discuss the backup or, or what, what you've proposed? Several folks have asked me, it seems exorbitant, the amount uh, to remove um, the shell piles from the, from the sandy, portions of the beach uh, can you can you give us the rationale for that price tag sure commissioner uh, Tim day deputy director natural resources management um, you know as it happened at the last board meeting um, I did tell the board that I would get cost estimates um, for removal um, generally speaking each one of the reefs there's approximately 87 reefs uh, each reef is comprised of about 300 bags of oysters um, and the round number, uh, just kind of averaging out, it's just shy of $3,000 a reef uh, to remove. Uh, when it was constructed, uh, I'd just like to remind the board, it took 12 people working over seven months uh, to construct it. So it's, it's, it's a very labor intensive process. Um, you know, and so um, I've come up with a cost that, you know, if it were to be put out to bid, um, that I think we could have it accomplished within that budget. Okay. Um, and the other question I have, uh, it's kind of relevant and timely. Um, what we're seeing down in Lee County, I know they have different climate, a little bit warmer down there, but in the wake of the hurricane, they've had like 65 cases of Vibrio and dozens of deaths. That's what I heard on the news, dozens. So uh, I think that's a legitimate concern for our area in the, in the warmer months. And, you know, having those so close in reading the um, coastal engineers report that that was brought forward um, if this isn't meeting the objective of nourishing the beach or maintaining the beach or keeping it from eroding um, and then you have the increased threat of uh, this vibrio which is can kill you um, I, you know I, I i just don't i don't see the hesitance uh, to moving forward with your plan I think there's other ways that you can improve the water quality you can put the oyster piles in deeper water away from where people swim um, and, you know, I, I did bring it for discussion, Doug. I didn't know you were going to be out of town on a, on a jet ski trip. I don't, I don't monitor your, your calendar. I was asked to bring it, and I brought it, and we had a good discussion. And I think the staff's bringing forth a plan that makes sense um, with some selected removals at sandy beach areas where people like to swim and perhaps some redeployment to deeper water to accomplish the same goal, clean the water, uh, prevent erosion. Um, and so I, I'd like to move forward with what they've brought. And, and that's that's where I'm at on it. What what do you need from this board? This is a discussion. We don't necessarily have to take a vote, but what do you need today from us? So, Commissioner, just one thing to be clear: um, the dollars that you have projected mm -hmm. um, projects, uh, presuming that the board had wanted um, to to fully remove the project. Okay. Um, it certainly can be scaled back 
Um, you know, there, it also includes some reefs that are not immediately adjacent to White Sandy Beach that where it appears that people are actively swimming. But it's, uh, this project has been so controversial, I was trying to do a worst case scenario. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I look forward to but, your continued revision of the plan going forward, and perhaps you know maybe the ultimate decision gets made uh, uh, as Commissioner Underhill stated. You know, once the new member takes his seat. Um, but appreciate staff putting together that plan so quickly. Frankly, I didn't know you'd be able to do it so quickly. So I'm, I'm glad that you were able to do it. Any other discussion, Mr. Chairman? If I'm yeah, here. Doug. I want to clarify, Tim. Um, it was just stated that you know he, that this is your plan. Um, it's my understanding that you've responded to the, uh, the board's instruction to show what it would take to um, roll it back or unwind yes, it, sir. I think was the terminology. As a scientist, is this what you would recommend, the removal of that? What I would just recommend is just we've spent an enormous amount of time on this project over the last five years. Um, it, it's what I would recommend that we move forward with is working with the new commissioner. Um, staff would very much recommend uh, looking at a, a way to master plan the area, um, just like we're doing over at uh, Bayatahar, Carpenter's Creek. It's for the budget we had, this was the best project we could move forward with. Um, we see a lot of benefits that aren't identified in uh, the Really, it's a, a, a light study that was done by the coastal engineer. Um, but in just looking at this with potential conflicts with swimmers or, or young children playing on the piles, it's, uh, it's looking like that uh, we need to move forward with something uh, that may be further offshore or look at alternate me measures to try to stabilize the shoreline, um, including bringing additional sediment in. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up, we've we've got the uh, county attorney's report. Allison, you're recognized. Yes, commissioners. There um, are four action items and one information item, which could be taken as one motion, if you wish. Mr. Chairman, I move the county attorney's report four action items in the affirmative. Second. Oh, we do have a speaker, uh, but we can move them forward. We can. You, did you second it, Robert? Yes. Okay. Motion is second. Now we'll have the speaker. We'll bring the speaker up, and then we will vote on that. I appreciate the motion. Commissioner Barry, uh, let's see. Uh, we have a speaker on the on the four action items. Uh, we don't have a speaker on the four action items. No, I think just on the discussion item. Okay, never mind. My apologies. We don't. So uh, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on any of this? If we vote specifically, cat one uh, one through four. Yep. No. No issue. So if we vote on this, um, uh, Leon Salters going to be taken care of? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Please vote. That passes three to one with Commissioner Underhill voting against. Um, next up, we've got CAT 2 discussion, and we do have a speaker on 2-1. There are two pieces to this. They could be done in one motion, of course, but... Um you could also have two different results with A and B. Okay. All right. We have the speaker, um, Melissa Pino, you're recognized. Three minutes. Thank you, Chairman Bergash, Melissa Pino, 413, Southeast Poblets. And as luck would have it, two items that have been really near and dear to my heart for years hit on the same day. They're really traumatic emotional items for me and for a lot of people and no one more than Kate and her husband Steve and um, I've got the sentence recommendation here uh, at the beginning of this hot mess I, really I know everyone is so tired of hearing about this um, I wish I didn't have to speak to it today but I wouldn't be able to look myself um, in the mirror if I didn't just imagine at the beginning of this, she was staring down the barrel of racketeering, 30 years, uttering a forged instrument, five years, official misconduct, five years, paramedic license fraud, one year. And if I hadn't hired a criminal 
attorney, Kim Skivoski, to respond to the summons that I got to go talk to FDLE in the state's attorney's office. Who knows how this would have ended up? She was handcuffed in her uniform at the EOC. She didn't do any of this. Um, she, th there's no pleading. She did not plead guilty. And as I said in the last meeting, I can completely understand why the county attorney would have looked at this at one point and said, this is egregious. Because if they really had done this stuff, it was egregious. But now it's time, I believe, to um, make it right and make them whole. Uh, I want people to think about the fact that Craig Ammons who was one of the people that came forward and stated that he was knowingly functioning on expired certs. He was offered a clemency period that nobody else knew about. Now the thing is, Kate wouldn't have been taking care of a, using a clemency period because she needed no clemency because this was a setup. Craig Ammons retired with full honors. I think he got thrown a party, right? Kate and her husband got $30,000 of um, criminal uh, legal fees alone. And that's, I'm only addressing those. I'm not even talking about the DOH. So I, really the best thing to my mind that can happen is that this situation gets healed and we let these people move on. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Chair, would entertain a motion or discussion on this topic? Mr. Chairman, I move item A and B in the affirmative. I'll second the motion. Please vote. Sorry. There's still that one that's still outstanding though, right? Just to be clear, B is clearly already paid for. We know the amount, the receipts are included. On A, she has paid $5,000. It is not over. She is asking that we prospectively agree to reimburse her for what she's paid, but also prospectively pay for what is to come in her FDOH defense. So it, I'm assuming that is what your motion is, but you guys can certainly dissect it out if you wish. That is the motion. And that's my second. OK. Mr. Chairman, give us just a second. I apologize. OK. You got the motion, you good? All right. Appreciate everyone's patience. Oh, and that item does not pass. It's a 2-2 tie, which means the item does not move forward. Commissioner, Commissioner uh, Barry and myself voted for, Commissioner Underhill and Commissioner Bender voted against. Um, Commissioner, I'll, I'll move item B. You're gonna move item B, okay. Uh, we have a motion to move item B. I will second the motion. Any discussion? Please vote. And that item passes three to one with Commissioner Underhill voting against. I appreciate the motion, uh, Commissioner Bender. Um, and I guess we can always come back for A at a later your, date, depending. Your policy allows you to do a number of things. You can ask for additional information. You can have it come back at a later date. Sure. You can certainly make it a board decision. You want to wait until you see the outcome. It's, yeah. You have a, a lot of discretion on that. Yeah, and, and item B was the expensive one, I believe. So uh, and that, that helps. And I will, I will point out, um, these charges were dismissed. This person was a victim, a victim of a, an abusive supervisor that was allowed to run amok in this county. Every single person that she pointed the finger at has been exonerated, exonerated. It was a disgrace that it happened. It should never happen again. As long as I'm here, it won't happen. She's gone and we're gonna make it right for these people. And starting with today and starting with some previous votes that we've made for other paramedics. No, one employee doesn't get to run amok 
destroy the careers of good people and sue ordinary citizens and then sue the county? Yeah, it was a disastrous train wreck going off a cliff and our better days are ahead of us because she's gone now. That's my opinion. I have free speech and I'm gonna say it. All right, uh, before we go to the final item, um, Representative Salzman, please come forward. I know she has some announcements. She's gotta to run to another meeting, but she's been very patient. And uh, we had planned to land this plane by 11 o'clock, but we had a lot of discussions. So Representative Salzman, you're recognized. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate y'all giving me a moment. I just wanted to make sure that the community was aware that we do food distributions in the North End every three months. Um, and the next one is November the 12th. Uh, we have a food distribution we're doing, a Thanksgiving meal, where we have it donated from various agencies to include farm share. Uh, we'll have that at the um, Gonzales Methodist Church in Cantonment. Uh, I would also like to say a huge thank you to one of my biggest partners on this board this last couple of years, which has been Commissioner Barry, who always, when I text him and say, I need a forklift like right now. And he says, okay, I'll find you one when we're in the middle of food distribution and it fails. And, and if I can't get enough money to feed those people, he always finds the money to feed those people. And I don't know that he even tells anybody he does it. I try, I try to tell people and he shows up to every single one of them and he helps hand out the food with, um, with the sheriff and some other partners. So, um, but I just want to make sure the community is aware that we do that every three months and the next one is November 12th Fantastic. and it will be a Thanksgiving meal. Uh, that will be after the election, I believe. Uh, I will either have been reelected or not. So this is my last time addressing the board as my first term state representative for District 1. And I just wanted to say thank you to um, most of you on the dais for being great partners in this, um, even though Bender didn't win the um, state cook-off. He is my favorite <laughs> District 4 commissioner. Um, anyway, I, I appreciate each and every one of you very much. Y'all have been great partners this past couple of years. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be running again. I haven't made that decision yet, so um, we'll see what happens after this this cycle coming up. But, um, but I just wanted you to know on record for everybody else to know, y'all have been great. I mean, I know I have crazy ideas, and you guys are always so calm and, and kind and, and help me through it, so thank you very much. Well, thank you for that and the self-deprecating comments. I really appreciate that, but I will tell you, I was at the state cook-off as well, Robert, and that steak that, that the fire the fireman made was incredible. It was amazing, and I threw one of my coupons into their basket, so I, I tried to help because that, that was amazing. That it steak. was really good, but when, you, good. When, when it comes to the judge's cold, it's automatically a loss. Right. And I don't know if the guy stood there for 10 minutes waiting to be next or what, but I, I mean, I love my firemen. Y'all know I fight for them, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it is what it is. There's a lot of good stake out <laughs> only, there. Only one person can be a winner. So. That's right. Well, thank you for everything you do, Michelle, <laughs> you. And, and good luck in your election. Thank you. And look, I'm not on the ballot, but I will tell everyone, look, go and vote. Go and vote. It's coming up. Early voting is starting any day now. Get out there and vote. Last election I was in, less than a third voted. Less than a third. Get out and vote. Do your research, find your candidates, and vote. That's all. Um, otherwise, when you come and complain about stuff and you haven't voted, really, do you, do you really have a leg to stand on? Get out there, get educated, and vote in this election. A lot of big things on the ballot, a lot of important things. So my two cents worth. Uh, Commissioner Barry, you recognized for a discussion on broadband. Yeah, I, I was just going to briefly uh, thank you, Michelle, for the comments. It has been, uh, it's been a great partnership and your, uh, your organization and your ability to bring some of the state assets to the table, uh, especially with the food distribution, has changed the, uh, you know, has changed the days and, you know, perhaps even weeks because of the amount of food that's given out for thousands of uh, thousands of my constituents, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to update the board. Um, no action needed today, but what, uh, what you did give me the opportunity to do was to waive the blackout period to be able to have some conversations with some folks. And what's, uh, you know, what's become clear is that we've got, uh, and we are, you know, moving forward, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully by the next meeting, if not the one after that, but hopefully by the next one, we can potentially bring back an MOU between the county and uh, the joint venture of Connexon and Escambia River Electric Cooperative. Um, they've made, uh, you know, what, what is a very strong, very strong bid to bring uh, to bring fiber to the home of every uh, of every resident and business within the Escambia River Electric Co-op footprint. Um, that just 
it's, it's hard to imagine this because, you know, we each represent about the same amount of people and that's only, you know, a portion of, uh, you know, a portion of my population. But geographically, their footprint is about half of the square miles in Escambia County. So just to give you a little bit of a reference. So what we're looking at is actually um, kind of moving the, the first phase went out uh, being north of nine and a half mile road. What I'm actually, the MOU that hopefully I'll bring back is actually only going to be constrained to the footprint that is the, uh, that is the EREC footprint. And they're going to work with, uh, they're going to work with Scott McDonald about the, you know, geographical uh, lines what they exactly are, um, but give or take, it's going to be, you know, Molina Road North, um, you know, in that in that ballpark. Um, uh, Molina Road does run river to river, as do they. So give or take, it'd be Molina Road North, um, and then at that same time, I'll kind of ask y'all to um, move forward with phase two of the project, which would be the rest of the county. So all it's really doing is moving that northern boundary from for the second phase from nine and a half mile to be the uh, co-op footprint. Mm -hmm. So the next phase will actually cover the rest of the county, which will also include um, everything related to the Department of Transportation's ATMS project. And we do have their specs. We do have FDOT's specs now for what they what they need, what they uh, what they are going to require um, for the ATMS project to get deployed, which obviously ties back into that traffic management center that's going to be going by public safety. And um, um, and part of that process for the second phase is actually also going to include, um, you know, kind of negotiating with FDOT for their contribution towards that southern phase project, just, you know, kind of as an FYI, but we just wanted to update you. No, I appreciate that, Commissioner Barry. Do we do we have any grasp of what the, the costs are going to look like? I know a lot of folks are asking me, and I, of still, course. Still, work, still working on that, but that certainly will be a part of, uh, uh, that's certainly going to be a part of what comes back the next time. But okay. we are we are still negotiating some of that. Do you think? Do you have even a, a back of the back of the envelope? Uh, I mean, is it? It's within the parameters of what we discussed yes. before. Well, I, I feel confident. I feel confident of that. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, for, the, for the whole county. Yes. That's certainly. fantastic. Yeah. No, no. I pre it's a big discussion. It's a big item. COVID and the shutdown of everything taught us the lesson of how important that is. So I look forward to uh, to what you bring back. And when did you say you think we'll probably have that? I'm hopeful. I mean, it, you know, we are we are dealing with three parties. Um, you know, I think uh, the Skimby River Co-op is is um, you know they have they have counsel, but uh, the Connection Group, you know, is a, is a large organization that's going to have their you know that's going to have general counsel involved as well. So it's just a matter of getting the uh, uh, getting the attorneys' offices to uh, you know to come to agreement about terms and and things. We I do believe that they have provided. Uh, the joint venture has provided some, you know, templates of some other agreements potentially to work off, you know, to kind of use as, uh, you know, as a template going forward for our agreement. Um, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that we're able to bring that back to the first board meeting in November. That's what I'm hoping. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right. That's and, 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 and just also to give you an idea, we would be fully built out in 18, 20 months, you know, less than two years. I mean, it, it, for that, for that phase, which, like I said, it's such a huge geographical part of the county. That timeline is uh, uh, that timeline is very it's fantastic. I yeah. mean, that, that opportunity to bring, bring this service to my constituents is uh, something five years ago I never thought I would have had the opportunity. Now that's amazing. I look forward to that discussion. All right, uh, gentlemen, we have reached the end of our agenda. Do oh, I, yeah, you know what? We had one speaker who wanted to speak on broadband. Who was that again? David. Oh, David Delman, I'm sorry, from Cox Communications. He's been sitting here patiently. I thought you were just here wanting to see how our meetings go. Uh, I, I, you definitely got all of that, didn't you? Welcome, you're recognized. Thanks Thank for you your so patience. Much. David Delman, Market Vice President for Cox Communications, 3405 Macklemore Drive. Thank you for allowing me a few moments this morning to speak with you. Cox may be a large company, but we have a very small town personality. We employ more than 350 team members here on the Gulf Coast, the majority of which are Escambia County residents. Each one of you on the dais knows and works with multiple Cox employees. We're not a faceless organization. Our employees earn more than $24 million in wages and salaries, generating $530 million in total Gulf Coast economic impact. We also support critical government programs through $18 million in tax revenues and franchise fees. Each year, Cox invests in the construction of technology infrastructure in Pensacola, supporting an additional $68 million in economic activity and 450 jobs through these projects. Cox is invested in enhancing the lives of Gulf Coast residents. It's our culture to give back to the communities we serve. As you all know, Cox has been a, long, a longtime partner of Escambia County, not only as a cable and broadband provider, but also as a community supporter. 
We partner on community events with the county and individual commissioners such as the Miracle League, Soul Bowl, and countless other events that occur within your districts. Through programs like Connect to Compete and Connect Assist, we have worked to bridge the digital divide and provide families and students affordable internet. We've also helped thousands of Florida's, Floridians enroll in the Affordable Connectivity Program, making internet more affordable and in some cases free for those who need it most. In 2021, Cox gave back over $1 million in cash and in-kind services to organizations along the Gulf Coast, which includes Escambia, Okaloosa, and Walton counties. And we're happy to announce that next month we'll cut the ribbon on a brand new technology lab we're funding at the Boys and Girls Club on H Street in Pensacola. As you can see, we have a long history of serving and giving back to the residents of Escambia County, and we want to continue working with you to close the digital divide. As a finalist for the broadband RFP, we're asking for an opportunity to present our proposal to bring broadband to the unserved residents of Escambia County, just as the RFP envisioned. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Delliman, for being here. Sure. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Um, is there anything else for the good of the order? Seeing none, we're adjourned. Be right back in a second.